to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series, which can be heard on VHHA.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. We're also on the radio each Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, 107.7 FM, and 820 AM across Central Virginia, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send any questions, comments, or feedback to PCFpodcast at VHHA.com. That's PCFpodcast at VHHA.com. I'm Will Selden with VHHA, and today we're delighted to be joined by Mindy Conklin, founder and executive director of Hitting Cancer Below the Belt, a Richmond-based nonprofit dedicated to promoting early detection and treatment of colorectal cancer. Mindy, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate the opportunity, Will. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So just by way of a little background, Hitting Cancer Below the Belt began back in 2012 when it was formed not long after the passing of your husband, Rich, from colorectal cancer, which is now the second most deadly form of cancer for men and women in the U.S. So if you wouldn't mind, could you tell us a little bit about sort of the journey of channeling that loss into public awareness advocacy and then more generally how the work that you and HCB2 does has evolved over the past decade? Yeah. Well, yeah. Gosh, 11 years ago, Rich passed in 2011. He was 43 at the time of his passing, 41 at the time that he was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer with no symptoms that I knew of, nothing that he had told me. So when he passed in 2011, I resigned from my career about six months after he passed and took about a year off, not quite sure what I wanted to do. And I realized I needed to be doing something about bringing awareness and bringing education and supporting cancer patients. There's just so much silence that surrounds this disease. And it just really bothered me that nobody was talking about this disease. I searched and there was nobody in Virginia. There is a nonprofit in DC, a rather large nonprofit, but there's nobody locally with boots on the ground actually raising the level of conversation about it. So I started a 5K. I'm a runner. So I thought, you know what, we'll just do a 5K. And I teamed up with a colorectal surgeon, Dr. Vollenberg from Colon and Rectal Specialist, who also wanted to start a 5K. And so together, we decided to work with the Richmond Roadrunners and to help us create the very first event in 2013. And it's called the Boxer Brief 5K. We have it every year in June. Our 10th annual one is coming up on June 11th. And it's right here in Richmond. And we raised a lot of money and then we gave all the money away to certain large national organizations. And then the next year, we did the same thing, 2014. And by this time now, we have a board membership. We have volunteers. And I didn't want to cut checks to national organizations. I was beginning to realize that there was great need here in the Richmond area. A lot of people were not getting screened. A lot of people were not also understanding the importance of gut health. So we fast forward to where we are now. We built out a small but very mighty grassroots nonprofit that now is based here in Richmond, but we actually serve the entire state of Virginia. Where we are now is we fund colorectal cancer screening programs at nine different medical sites. We have five here in Richmond, one east of the city, and three up in the Northern Virginia area. And we're always looking to partner with other free clinics or FQHCs, any medical site that actually serves the underserved or uninsured population because they're at a very high risk. And then at the same time, we also offer nutrition support to cancer patients as they're going through treatment. So you actually introduced the organization really well because we are a colorectal cancer prevention and early detection organization. We don't raise money for research. There's a lot of it, obviously national organizations that do that. They do great work, but we are more on the prevention and early detection side. And then we also have a huge educational component, which, gosh, we use a, an array of methods of getting the word out from blogs to podcasts to social media posts to interviews with celebrities. And then, of course, on-site presentations at schools, civic organizations, large and small businesses, and then our inflatable colon. I literally just got back from Roanoke Memorial. We partnered with Carillion this week and brought our large inflatable resources into the Roanoke area. So we travel quite a bit across the state with the inflatable colon, and we're able to do presentations via Zoom or on-site as well. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. We have a board membership of, I believe there's 12 members now. We also have an advisory council. They're phenomenal, always giving us advice. And then we just started a junior board, which consists of high school students across the Richmond area. And we're thrilled to have 15 members on this junior board. And they are creating content, creating social media posts, all about gut health and colorectal cancer prevention. And they're doing great work right now. 
So, yeah, we're busy, but everybody who's involved, from the volunteers to our small little staff, we are very dedicated to um, defeating this disease. Well, that's such a powerful story, and I've been around HDB2 a little bit, and I've seen the inflatable colon, and I'm sure that gets a lot of attention across the state, so I'm so glad that that's something you all have access to. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, can you tell us a little bit about Rich as a person, just so our audience can hear a little bit about the man who inspired the work that y'all are doing? Yeah. Well, he was a collegiate athlete. He played football in college. He was still athletic, you know, in his 30s and early 40s. Even at the time of diagnosis, he moonlighted as a high school football coach at Clover Hill High School. And he was completely dedicated to his family. Family was first. His actual career was in sales. He worked for AT&T on major accounts. But um, he went into that field because he could always, you know, work his schedule around the kids' schedule. And so I would have to say he probably picked the kids up from practices and of everything that they were involved in growing up <laughs> a lot more than I did. I couldn't cut away from work. So um, his kids were everything. And Christian and Morgan, they were 17 and 19. My son was a freshman at University of Richmond, and my daughter was a junior in Clover Hill High School when um, their father passed. We met in Northern Virginia at a very young age, got married and had kids at a very young age. And so we were married for 20 years. And um, he is the baby out of seven. So he understood family dynamics and he loved family. And he literally was the soul of our and the heartbeat of our family. Thanks so much for sharing that. We're recording this episode yeah. in March during Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And a lot of times the conventional thinking about this form of cancer or other forms of cancer is that it traditionally afflicts people who are middle-aged or older which yeah. is why physicians and other doctors suggest screenings start at age 45. However, mm -hmm. there's emerging data showing a rise in cases in people in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about those data points generally? And then strategically, do you feel like that requires a shift in our approach to outreach and communication with young adults about this disease? Without a doubt, yeah. And we actually say screening starts by 45. 45 is the deadline. It's not when you start thinking about screening. And the reason why we say that is because if you have a family history or if you have, you know, symptoms, you need to be speaking with your medical provider about your screening options and most likely begin screening earlier than 45. So 45 is the deadline. And the main reason why we're in the high schools is because of that sharp increase of colorectal cancer diagnosis in the younger community. And unfortunately, these folks are being diagnosed at the later stages because it's not being caught early. Either they're disregarding some symptoms or the doctors might be disregarding the symptoms when they come in and, and don't automatically think maybe this young person age 28 needs to be tested. A chilling um, experience recently, my son, who is now 30, but at age 29, he got his third colonoscopy. So his dad was diagnosed at 41, stage four colorectal cancer, right? So traditionally, what is told to folks who have a family history, you start colonoscopy screening 10 years from your relative diagnosis. That would have meant that Christian would have started screening at age 31. Well, I actually had my kids start getting screened at age 20 because at age 41, my husband had stage four colorectal cancer, nine tumors on his liver and two on his lung, and he never drank and he never smoked. So it obviously wasn't induced by um, alcohol. So basically, that means colorectal cancer, by the way, is a, is a, can be a slow-growing cancer. That he most likely had a cancerous polyp around age 31 or 32, my husband. So I went 10 years back even further. And so when my kids graduated from college, that was their graduation present, a colonoscopy, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So now they get screened every three to five years, starting in their early 20s. Now, I did have to fight with insurance to help pay for that cost. However, now at age 29, he just got his third colonoscopy. The results came back. The two polyps that they took off were precancerous at age 29. What would have happened if I had listened to traditional medicine advice? No, Christian doesn't need to be screened until he's 31. Those two precancerous polyps would have had two more extra years to grow. This sends chills down my spine. I think it's incredibly important when we're talking about family history is not just to be blasé about, oh, start 10 years from your first degree relative diagnosis. We really need to think a little bit more outside the box and ask some questions. Was it a stage two diagnosis or was it a stage four diagnosis? That means that cancerous tumor has been growing in there for a very long time. And then do the math. So, you know, I'd lead in with that because I think the research is really actually showing that it's actually lifestyle that's actually puts people at a higher risk than actually family history. However, family history is around 30 percent. So we can't ignore family history. But at the same time, we also have to be much more patient 
centered, client centered when we're working with someone who does have a family history. And I believe ask even more questions. And I share that with you all because I believe on this podcast is for folks who, who work in the medical profession. Yeah, that's so important to note. And you touched on it a little bit, but in your opinion, what are some other common sense guidelines about healthy lifestyle choices that people can make to hopefully prevent colorectal cancer? It's just a healthy way to live life, right? Just to be mindful, right? Just to kind of pay attention. And, you know, people will joke and say, you know, listen to your gut. You know, what is your gut telling you? But seriously, your body's always talking to you. And we want to listen to it before it screams at you. Once it's screaming at you, there's an actual issue. But you can usually kind of find out like what's going on, such as when you're using the restroom. Are you eliminating your bowels every single day, at least once a day, if not multiple times a day? Is it a firm stool, kind of snake-like stool? What color is it? I mean, actually pay attention to what's coming out of you. We certainly pay attention to our meals, right? We like to eat. We might want to actually, we say, take a peek below the seat and actually see what's actually coming out of us. Is there blood in the stool? Is it a thin stool? Be mindful. Do you have diarrhea one day? Then maybe chronic constipation for a few days and then explosive diarrhea again. Irregular bowel habits is also an issue that we need to be paying attention to. On our prevention side of hitting cancer below the belt, we have something called the Fight Right Initiative. Basically, if we're going to be fighting to prevent cancer and fighting to make sure cancer doesn't take any more of our lives, let's fight the right way. Let's fight right. So there's three things that we talk about. And that's, again, being mindful about how we breathe every day how we move every day, and how we eat every day. We have to breathe every day, right? <laughs> we, we move every day, and we eat every day. How are we doing it? Are we doing it well? Are we taking our large breaths? Are we relaxing our shoulders? Are we making sure that we're getting oxygen, full oxygen in and oxygen out, as opposed to the rapid, shallow breathing that can bring even more issues with that constant drip of cortisol? And then how are we moving? Are we getting enough exercise? Are we stretching? Are we getting too much exercise? And then at the same time, you know, what are we putting in our mouth? Is it something that's actually going to, we like to say, restore the cells, restore the body? Is it going to heal the body, everything that you eat? As opposed to thinking, well, I need to eat for fuel. That's for sure. Yeah, you do need to eat for energy. Right. But primarily, let's think about eating to actually recover our cells. Let's actually eat to make sure that we are healing our body. It's a whole different mind change. And so it doesn't really add more to your to-do list because you're already breathing, you're already moving, you're already eating. So instead, let's just be mindful about how we're doing that. And that's really the very first step that we like to talk about on the prevention side of hitting cancer below the belt. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's, that's really important information, I think. So I want to shift back a little bit to some of the work that you all do with HCB2, including that Boxer Brief 5K, which for our listeners, I have witnessed. I did not run in it. <laughs> I'm a little bit ashamed of it. I didn't run in it, but I have witnessed it. As, it was a great event. So can you tell us a little bit about the community that y'all have created around this disease? Because from my personal experience, it just felt like such a positive, uplifting environment where people really care about the person standing next to them. And I'm curious about how y'all sort of cultivated that environment. Yeah, it kind of happened organically, right? I mean, we've got some teams that have been with us for 10 years. For one in particular, Team Purvis. I'll never forget Chester Purvis. Gosh, 2013, the very first boxer brief. They pushed him in like a wheelchair, the whole 3.1 miles, and he got up and he crossed the finish line. And he was very sick. Well, he passed away a few months after that. Well, Team Purvis still comes every year to participate, and they come from all over the country. Two years ago, it was a virtual boxer brief, obviously because of the pandemic. But in 2021, we have a hybrid and we still have the 5K as a hybrid. You can participate virtually. However, they still come every year. Last year, they were on site again. There's, oh gosh, dozens of other teams that are the same way, whether their loved one has passed away or maybe the loved one is actually a survivor and doing great and they still come. So it really is about caring for everybody. We just had an interesting story come out from last year, and I'll share this really briefly. Team Kirby is for Tom Kirby. Tom Kirby is a stage three colorectal cancer survivor. He asked one of his buddies last year to be on his team. His buddy is an avid cyclist. He does the cap to cap race every year. He can bike 100 miles without really thinking too much about it. His name is Steve. Steve had never had a colonoscopy. He's in his late 50s. So Steve said to Tom, you know what? If I'm supporting you, I've got to at least go get screened. I've been delaying it. I haven't gotten screened yet. He goes in for his routine screening, no symptoms, and he finds out he has stage three colorectal cancer. So now he's gone through treatment, and now Team Kirby is now Team Kirby and Team Steve. And the race actually saved a life. And we know that this does happen quite a bit. Sometimes we don't even hear about it. But this one was very poignant because it happened just last year 
and Team Kirby. Tom Kirby was a relatively new colorectal cancer survivor. So I think that was probably his first year even participating in the 5K. So his decision, Tom Kirby's decision to participate in this 5K had saved his friend's life. So everybody really does care about each other at this event. And I would say about 65% of the people walk. We have some really fast runners, of course, and we have awards, age group awards, but the bulk of the folks who are participating they're walking, they're singing, they're dancing, and they're hugging each other. So, yeah, I, I'm glad you picked up on that vibe. Yeah, it really was such a fantastic environment to be in. So thanks so much for sharing that. People who want to learn more about Hitting Cancer Below the Belt and the work that y'all do should visit hcb2.org. That's hcb and the number 2.org. Mindy, any last words about that or any other resources that you want folks to be aware of? Well, yeah, thank you so much for the time. And again, we are just getting into the high schools. We think that's where prevention needs to start is educating about gut health and colorectal cancer prevention at that younger age. And the junior board is open to any high school students within the Richmond area. So yeah, I just want to make sure that your folks know that and they can contact H for hitting, C for cancer, B for belt and the number two dot org to learn more. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And Mindy, before we let you go, so we have a tradition on this podcast to close things out by asking our guests a few lighthearted questions just to give folks a sense of who you are outside of your work. So to keep things interesting, we've developed a, a list of 10 mystery questions that we'd like you to choose from. So the way we'll do this is you'll just select two numbers between 1 and 10, and then I'll ask you the corresponding question. So when you're ready, feel free to give me those numbers. All right. The first number will be 2, and the second number will be 10. All righty. First question, what is your ideal vacation destination and why? The mountains. I was so thrilled to be just in Roanoke to see, you know, the, the Blue Ridge Mountains. There's just refreshing, right? I mean, how cool are the mountains? It just seems to be calm. It's quiet. You can hike and camp. Just the beauty of it. So, yeah, give me the mountains any day. I'm with you. I just went skiing the other week, and, and it was great to uh, be up in the mountains. Jealous. Yeah. All righty. Final question of the podcast. And this is a tough one. If you could choose one superpower, what would you choose? Oh, I'd love to fly. Yeah. Yeah, I sure. can't go wrong with that. Yeah, because yeah, I just a couple years ago I went skydiving, and I would do that in a heartbeat again. Yeah, I would love to fly. Well, those are a couple great answers. And with that, I think we're going to bring this episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast to a close. If you like what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so you know when new episodes are released. We want to once again thank our guest, Mindy Conklin, founder and executive director of Hitting Cancer Below the Belt, for joining us today. Seriously, thanks so much for chatting with us, Mindy. It's been great. Really appreciate it, Will. Thank you.